uh, I think let's get things straight. We are all trying to do the best for our patients all of the time. However, in the present climate, it's all about money. And so we have to do our best for all of our patients, not just the individual patient, but at a population level as well, and decide where is money best spent. And so the real big question is whether TAF truly has an advantage over tenofovir, not only for the treatment of hepatitis B, but also for the treatment of HIV. And if there is any advantage, whether that is financially feasible. And I'm going to put it to you that TAF is really just an illusion. All right? It's just like the Indian rope trick. It's not real. It's an illusion which is there and offers practically no real clinical advantage to you in your clinical practice. And what you have to remember is we're talking about money. We're talking about generics. It's not just about TAF and tenofovir. It's about as many drugs are now going through into generics, what that means for us as prescribers and also what it means for the pharmaceutical companies who are making the mother drug. This is the amount of income that pharmaceutical companies lose when drugs come off patent. If you look at all these drugs which have come off patent in the last few years, we're not talking about drug companies losing a few hundred thousand or even a few million dollars or pounds. We're talking about billions of dollars of loss of revenue. If you look at these three drugs, you look at Singulaire, look at Plavix, look at Seroquel, highly prescribed drugs, and what happened in the year that generics came out, they lost 90% of their revenue. If you look at Singulaire, it lost 90% of its revenue within four weeks of the generics becoming available. And what drug companies do is they use a technique called evergreening to actually make you, convince you, to continue to prescribe their drug in new formulations, new doses. First of all, they build a strong brand, and clearly Tenofovir has a really, really strong brand. It's got a strong brand as the leading nucleoside nucleotide in HIV, the treatment of choice in hepatitis B. But as drugs start to go off patent, what happens is they either invent new dosages, new formulas to delay the introduction of generics. And what they do most commonly, and what they have done with tenofovir moving to TAF, is a technique called chemical magic, where they bring out this fantastic new drug which merely is an illusion to you as prescribers. And too often, we fall for it. I fell for this one. This is uh, omeprazole. So omeprazole uh, is uh, uh, an L and S antima, a mixture of the two. What happened when omeprazole came off patent? They brought out this fantastic drug called ezomeprazole, which was much, much stronger. Ezomeprazole is a meprazole, but only the S antima. We were all convinced that ezomeprazole was this far better drug. All you have to do is double the dose of omeprazole and you get the same level of the active ingredient. It is just an illusion. And so realistically what they've done with TAF is convince you, using numbers which don't really matter, that TAF is a better drug than tenofovir. They've convinced you that this difference in concentration really matters for that patient using not clinical data, but numerical data. So the question is, really, does TAF offer any advantage over tenofovir, either as regards efficacy or as regards toxicity? What we've seen from Doug are some graphs with some numbers on it and some p-values. And actually, Doug ignores p-values, because if you look carefully at the ALT slide, there was no significant difference in ALT normalization using standard lab numbers. So let's have a look at efficacy. Is there any difference in efficacy between tenofovir and TAF as regards the ability to suppress the virus? The answer is no. Absolutely no advantage as regards efficacy. 
As regards toxicity, what we see is this small change in EGFR. You can see this number of around about minus four. So remember that number from these two studies. There was a difference in EGFR of four. What was the starting EGFR for these patients, Doug? You're an expert in hepatitis B. They were, it was about 100, right? It was about 100. So they all had normal EGFRs, okay? If we look at bone mineral density, again, yes, a numerical advantage, but we don't see any clinical data. So Doug, unfortunately, lives in this world which is like Disneyland, you know, where everything is basically made up. Well, all of us, I hope, live in a world which is based on reality. So what is the reality of a difference of minus four or a change in EGFR of four? This is data from the American or the definitions from the American uh, Kidney Association. First of all, to have chronic kidney disease, you need an EGFR of less than 60. For, an e for a chronic kidney disease we have an EGFR of less than 90, you must have other markers of renal damage, which these patients didn't have. And when we're talking about patients starting above 90, which was the average EGFR for these patients, the variance is around 30%. So 30% of 90, Doug, is 27. I think, no, it's not, is it? It's 30. No, it's not. It's about 27. But anyway, it's not minus four, is it? So within the variance of the tests is this difference in EGFR. So this EGFR means practically nothing. We're not talking about people heading for kidney transplants. We're not talking about people heading for dialysis. If we look at the bone mineral density, again, what we see is this small difference, which we're used to seeing within the HIV-infected population. And what we know is that this difference does not translate into a greater number of fractures. So the reality of this is we're talking about numbers, and that's all. The other thing for you to remember about hepatitis B-infected patients is that they've clearly become infected via a route. That route may be intravenous drug use, it may be sexually, it may be from mother to child transmission. And what we've got to remember about tenofovir-based therapies is that when they are used as pre-exposure prophylaxis, they will prevent transmission of HIV. Clearly, these people have put themselves at risk of acquisition of hepatitis B through sex or through drug use. The use of tenofovir to treat these patients with 3TC or FTT has been associated with prevention of HIV transmission, and we have none of that data with TAF. And this is how much those small numbers are going to cost you. Those small numbers that Doug talked about, small changes in EGFR, small changes in bone mineral density, this is the price of generic tenofovir with 3TC. This is the price of TAF-based therapy. This is in pounds per year. That is an awful lot of money to spend on small number changes. I think also, don't listen to me, I'm an individual. You can go to big organizations. This is a German organization which I think is a, uh, gives uh, proclaimants on whether drugs and strategies are worthwhile. And this is their conclusion, a big, big German organization. No added benefit for tenofovir alafenamide in chronic hepatitis B. So people as organizations have looked at this data as well and seen exactly the same. The choice is yours, but think about where else you could spend that money to treat other infections, other diseases, or even to prevent them. Thank you very much.